talking about words. Words have meanings to me, to us, to the extent that we have an experience with what the words is symbolizing. And the very simple one is if you love chocolate or chocolate cake, when the word, when you, we hear the word without realizing, we already start smiling because that is a, not an empty word. I may love the chocolate cake, but also it has been associated in my life with friendship, family gatherings, all kinds of things. So the chocolate cake is not an empty word. It brings a lot it's very rich with experiences and so when i hear the word there is something in my heart the heart responds to the word and in the quran we are told about uh, the people who when they hear the word allah god their heart trembles because they feel the awe because they know God, they live in the presence of his rububiyya. They are experiencing their rububiyya, that we are in need, and that our needs are being taken care of. And when we acknowledge that our needs are being taken care of, and we acknowledge the source, the rububiyya, and therefore the one behind the rububiyya, our Rabb, as God, then we start acting with that consciousness, with that awareness in the name of God, and that becomes everything is potential ibadah, worship, that awareness becomes a worshipfulness, that's rububiyya. So they are not just words they are realities so it is the same when we say we heard now the word imtihan but here imtihan is only one of a series there are lots of things explaining why in this world we have good and bad and imtihan is one of them but Regardless of that, because we heard the word and we have no reference, no context, neither the Quranic context, plus even if we had the right information, that information will start coming to life when we interact with it, when we start witnessing it in our life when we become aware of it it becomes a living reality and it contributes to our growth and then it becomes part or contributes to our iman and that iman is a grounded iman we grow in iman that iman comes as we start to know god as our rabb and we can only know god as our rabb through knowing who we are becoming aware of our needs and our limitedness so when we do that there is no misunderstanding about the believer as if in our misperceived imtihan and iman, we think that like the believer is like a zombie or robot, doesn't feel sadness or grief or anything. Not at all. The believer is a human being. But what we do with that sadness, how we perceive the sadness and the grief and the heartbrokenness is different. That's where the difference comes. Everyone is going to be grateful to some extent when their needs are being taken care of. But are we cultivating that gratitude and finding the source of the help, the one who is fulfilling our needs, directing that gratitude consciously to our Rabb? And the same with sadness and grief. If I believe without realizing that the sadness is mine and the grief is mine and everything is mine and I'm not used to going beyond the mulk, beyond the world. I'm not even seeing it as a mulk that has a malakut aspect, that everything is an ayah, that everything is created for purposes and meanings. Some of them will be revealed to us, but many won't. And the purpose of all that is to know our Rabb. We can only trust him when we know him. We cannot worship what we don't know. We cannot trust Allah if we don't know who Allah is. And we can only know who he is through knowing who we are and what's going on in the world from the Malakut aspect of things as we are taught in the Quran. If we see the world just like the non-believer, then where is God in this? It's just something that 
fitratan, yes, it is in the fitrah, it's true. And therefore, I'm not rejecting it and denying it. Yes, but that's not enough. That's just not denying. That's not knowing who he is. And so when we start learning to look beyond, to look the wisdom in things, why they are being, how they are being created, the purpose in their creation. When we start doing the iqra, read in the name of our creator, then that sadness, that grief, that being appalled at the injustice and the helplessness that comes with this, that's the gist of who we are as Ubudiyah is feeling the helplessness and that will is supposed to take us back to our Rabb. You alone is the just. You alone is the one who helps. You are the one helping us. You are the one helping everyone else. Now I can put my trust in him. And now when we come down, when we are not in the, that helpless, panicky state, if there is something that can be done, then we will be inspired to do it. But then when we live from this perspective and being aware of the reality of death and transience here and now always, it's it's transient. What is whatever is happening, the good and the bad is only now. An hour before is not here, an hour later is not here. In our ghafla, in our mindlessness, we forget about this reality. And so our sabr, our patience and forbearance is lost in the delusion that all the years before and all the years that may come after are all right now and I have no patience for them. The, the sadness and the grief is mine and I have to deal with them. They don't take me to God. My relationship and my connection to God is a theoretical, hypothetical. It's a claim. I have never nurtured that bond. I have never cultivated that love that comes when I get to know him and I get to know him through the ni'mah and the blessings and uh, witnessing the order and the wisdom in his creation and in our own creation, but also in the sadness and the grief and the helplessness. And that's where we are tried because when everything is well, I say Alhamdulillah, but is it truly Alhamdulillah? Praise and thanks belong to God alone. But actually, without realizing, if I have not gone through this kind of conscious terbiya, this conscious training and cultivating of Iman and living in the presence of God here and now and Wherever we turn, we see the face of God, we see the reflection of the beautiful names of God in the good when everything is fine. I cannot do it when it's not okay. Then in time of crisis, I am not going to be able to hand over or see the Malakut side or take the messages from the sadness and the grief because I will be totally submerged by the sadness and the grief. They take over. I don't know what to do with them. I Either I try to run away and suppress them or I become like the victim of the sadness of the grief. Whereas they are created to tell me about this world, to tell me about who I truly choose to be. Look at the ugliness of those who choose to not follow the path of Sirat al-Mustaqim, the path of God, the path of righteousness. Theoretically, we would not imagine, we could not fathom that the fruits of that tree are so ugly, so devastating, so appalling, so disgusting. We could not, but the ruh now feels and experiences there is no need to go to Jahannam. This is really something we want to run away from. So that sadness, that grief, that anger, they are all messages from God again telling us about him, about who he wants us to be and about how to prepare for Akhirah. And meanwhile, who we choose to be and therefore what we choose to do when we have and to the extent when we have the opportunity to do is what is going to make the difference between coal and diamond. And the difference between coal and diamond is because everyone knows they are both composed of carbon. But at the microscopic level, the arrangement of the atoms is different. Can you imagine? It's all carbon, but the atoms are arranged differently. And so the appearance is different, the 
hardness is different, the conductivity is different, like the properties of coal and diamond are totally different, but they are made from the same matter. Again, also, it's a good metaphor for if we think everything is only the matter part, then, okay, then coal and diamond is the same, but it's not. It's the arrangement. It's the processes they went through when they were being composed. And so these processes we are going through, like diamond has to have go through lots of pressure for a long time. And we say, no, I don't want to be a diamond. I'll stay. I want it easy as if. What are we here in this life for? I am created with the desire for health. So I strive for health. But if I get sick and very sick, it does not mean that I am now worse than the one who is healthy. In worldly terms, yes. And when I'm sick, I'm still made to seek health. But for instance, let's say I am sure I learned that there is no way to be healthy. So it's not the end of the world because if the world was permanent, it would be a problem because I'm given the desire for health and then I'm given a sickness that has no healing. But since this world is transient, then in itself, it's not better or worse. But if I make use of it to acknowledge and live and experience my need, my dependence on my Rabb and how much I need his help and the health, the more I make peace with that and accept it and I understand the gist, the core of who I am, that right now nothing belongs to me and nothing is under my control and everything is being uh, gifted to me, then if that is going to help me to witness this and experience it with the certainty of living it, not only knowing it, then the one who is in that situation may be much higher and he's got a fast lane to paradise, to fulfill the purpose of this life. But if I take that sickness to complain, to be unhappy about it, as if... The purpose of life is only this worldly, this dunya life. Then even if I was healthy, I would not give it its due and its gratitude. It won't do me any good anyway. But for the one who knows God and who chooses to surrender to reality, those situations can be opportunities. So it does not mean that we don't feel anything. No, it is the feeling we have to feel. Otherwise, how would I know? If someone is really hungry, then that person knows and acknowledges the value of food much more than someone who has all kinds of food. So if I am not practicing the Iqra, the read in the name of God, seeing the names of God in everything that happens within and without me, then we will start seeing the Malakut side, the angelic side. So we will start seeing the beautiful names of God in everything. Once we do that, each step is a choice. When we make the choice to live accordingly, then from coal to diamond process starts. And then we'll start to know God as our Rabb, the Rabb of everything, Rabbul Alameen. And we start trusting him. Trust means there are instances when we don't see the wisdom. But I know that I can't know. I am so limited. I only know what Allah reveals to me. And so if I don't understand the wisdom in many, many things. I don't say there is no wisdom. That's so arrogant. I just say, I don't understand, but I trust that Allah is all merciful, all powerful. If something is happening, it's happening with his permission that there must be khairun kathir, lots of goodness in it. And so I surrender. I trust him. I make tawakkul and I surrender. When we surrender, there is no helplessness. There is still sadness. If someone is sick, there may be still pain. But the pain of someone who is sick and rejects the situation and is angry at the situation is not the same as the pain of someone who is accepting it. I don't know, 
But I trust my God. He knows and I trust that he does not create anything without meaning and purpose. So that acceptance, that surrender makes things much more bearable. And knowing that there is only the now and we are, everything is flowing to akhirah. The ruh is more than hopeful. There is certainty that everything is unfolding, is going into the hereafter. It seems like it's far, but as the Prophet says, Kullu atin qareeb. If it is coming, it's close. It's so close because once we leave this world, afterwards, the concept of time when we are in ghafla, when we are stuck in the mulk, is based on a misperception of the world. When we are unaware of the reality of transience, the reality of death here and now, everything is flowing, then we don't have the right perspective. If you are inside the water, you can't see if it, is it an ocean, is it a river, is it? You, you're in it. So when we get out and we become aware of this reality, our perspective change and our perception of things change. And of course, the perception is eventually to have the perception that we are taught in the Quran, to look at everything from the Malakut side, the side that looks to God, to his beautiful names, that side that looks to the angels bringing the messages from the unseen. Iman bil ghaib is the start of our journey. Then the perception is totally different. Time doesn't feel like it's endless and my death seems very far Akhira, almost unreachable infinite no my death is not very far my death is every day and the day that i will live will be one of those days i can look at the past and have certainty of my death and so Akhira is very close so we don't lose hope from god as we are told in the quran only the qawm al-kafirun the disbelievers lose hope in god because they don't know who God is. They are not witnessing his rahma, his mercy, his loving care, his power, his wisdom here and now. So they can't trust him. Trust is something that is nurtured. And so it's something that is experienced. The more I experience that, even the things that I thought were bad, eventually I see they were there for a purpose. And of course, I have to also be convinced of the purpose of our creation and make peace with it, that we are not here for this world. And if I think we are here for this world to make achievements and things in this world, then I'm uh, in for a big uh, disappointment. Even in the most horrible things, there is God. And and the thing becomes unbearable because we don't see it as transient. We're stuck in it. And this inaya, this benevolence, this care, this loving care and wisdom necessitated that the all-wise one created the world to be a place of learning through experience an arena of examination because there is no learning if there is no examination and a page for the pen of divine determining and power qadar everything is being written right now there is nothing outside god's control this learning through experience and examination are the cause of growth and development through this learning all the beautiful names are coming through us so that we embody them because without embodying them we can't truly know them i say allah is compassionate but i don't show any compassion i don't feel any compassion I'm saying Allah is generous, but I don't want to share anything. If Allah is generous, everything that I have is the fruit of his generosity. He's being generous to me. Everything is being given. Then I cannot not give. In the beginning, of course, I say Allah is generous or Allah is the owner of everything. Yet I feel I am the owner. This is mine, so I am not going to give it. That's why we learn through tajruba, through exercises to practice it, to do it. So it says, you give, you share, you take care of others. As I start giving, one, two, three, and then I see I give, but things still come. And it becomes, oh, now I truly learn that he's the giver and he's generous and he's compassionate. And I start giving in his name. So as I'm giving, I witness that he's the giver. That sense of giving starts developing like muscles. That sense of compassion starts developing. And then I start witnessing that 
this feeling is not mine. It is also given. It is growing. And I'm just watching it. There is no knowing God with his name without the growth within us. Otherwise, it's just a claim. The disposition is actually istiadad, which is more like potential to unfold. And this unfolding causes the abilities to become apparent because the potential to be diamond, the potential to be mirror the names of God is in every human being. But to which extent they will become our ability, our reality, is our choice. And this relative truth causes the embroideries of the manifestations of the beautiful names to be displayed and the universe to be transformed into missives of the summit. And it is through this mystery that the diamond-like essences of elevated spirits are purified of the coal-like matter of base spirits. Can you imagine if we didn't go through this life and then everyone will be together forever? People who are the genocidal person and the very compassionate, loving person will be together for eternity. Isn't it better to have a seemingly rougher time, but everyone is separated? And within each individual, we are given the opportunity to cleanse and purify ourselves as well. Because we start also seeing the ugly side within us and ask for help and make istighfar and cleansing. So that when we go to that, inshallah, Dar al akhirah the realm of eternal abode of the hereafter, we are cleansed of the unwanted, the ugly and it's easier to see the ugliest when we see it outside, because when it's within us, we, we tend to suppress it and cover it up. So we are given the opportunity to cleanse ourselves and to be there with the diamond-like people and all the rest. The good and the bad come together so that, first, because... We know things through contrast, through their opposites. Otherwise, we would not be able to know the beautiful names of God. It means that is how we are taught the beautiful names of God. Through our helplessness, we know that God is the helpful, the powerful. Through our powerlessness, we appreciate power. And through the fact that we can get little pieces of power like things, then we get to appreciate it more. It's like we can see but our seeing is, first, it's not inherent to us. It can leave us anytime. Plus, it's very limited. So it's given to us only to understand and appreciate that God sees everything. Physically, metaphorically, however you want to understand it, includes all of it. So through opposites, we learn. That's the only way we can know who we are, what we're doing here, who God is everything. So we can't say there's why isn't there only good? If there was only light, maybe we wouldn't have a word for light because we wouldn't be aware that it is light. But because there is darkness through the contrast, we have words for them. And because there are many levels, darkness, it's very light, less light, and we get degrees. It's the same with beauty because there is an ugliness or a lack of beauty and suddenly we become aware we say more beautiful less beautiful we're not talking about relative which one you think is beautiful or not it doesn't matter the fact is there are many kinds and many degrees the fact that evil is here we are talking about the big chaos but it's because we don't have the right perspective always evil is a minority because evil is not created for itself it is created to serve goodness to bring out the variety and the endless degrees of goodness but we go and focus on one thing and we say it's everywhere it's chaotic all this sadness and anger and injustices and things they totally control us and we can't go beyond them and see beyond them we are disconnected at all levels we take all the goodness for for granted when something unwanted happens all my feelings are mine, not his. And now, what is this now? Of course, I cannot go out. I've put myself into a cocoon of steel chains. There is no way I can make sense of what's happening. Because everything is happening as if 
on its own. And then I am the one who doesn't like what's happening. And it's happening again horizontally because some nasty, vicious creatures are doing nasty things. And we're totally helpless. What can we do now? But if everything is under his power and I witness it and I have certainty, the first thing, the feelings come from him, I go back to him. When I go back to God, shall we not do anything? If there is anything to be done, you will know and you will be able to do it because we won't be stuck in fear. We live in a lie. The lie is that everything is happening on its own and it's here forever. And therefore, it seems like there is lack because we are focused only on what's missing. And therefore, of course, there will be fear, fear of death, fear of what will happen. There is no meaning, no purpose. We don't know where we are going. Shaitan means also fear and ingratitude. So if we focus on the gratitude for what we have, then we will be grateful. Alhamdulillah that we are feeling like this when a genocide is happening. Can you imagine if I couldn't feel like this? That is an evidence that our Rabb is the one who loves justice and makes us dislike injustice. He loves goodness. And that's why he's making me reject all the opposite of what he is and what he loves. So let's start with that those feelings are given to us. They make our Rabb known to us. They make us known to ourselves how helpless, how powerless we are. And within that powerlessness, there is power because now we don't have fear of the other because we know that everything happens only by divine will. And so now even dua, because it comes from the heart and because it's connected directly to the source of power, it is powerful. And dua is the most powerful thing. Even when we act, we should be acting as dua in the name of God, inshallah. That sadness, that anger will make us wake up and pray for not only these people we are hearing about, but Allah A'lam so many other people who need help and we're not even aware of it and alhamdulillah that this world is transient and alhamdulillah that allah is in charge and may allah that's why we make dua that allah uses us in his heart and serving in his name serving others is the living gratitude living ibadah so we become willing we want to serve we want to do something please but our doing is not, but it didn't change anything. We are not doing it for changing. Allah is in charge of the outcome. We are responsible for how we perceive things and our choices and how we respond. And the outcome is not in this transient life, but it's for akhirah.